Hello and welcome to episode 57 of Off the Bandstand. My name is Christian Wiggs. I am your host. Today's episode is Paul Baker, a published composer, arranger, and saxophonist residing here in Austin. Paul has performed with household names such as Ray Charles, Nancy Wilson, and Aretha Franklin, and is the founder of Baker's Jazz and More, a music publishing and retail company specializing in original big band charts for jazz ensembles of all levels. In this episode, we talk about writing inclusively for young musicians without sacrificing excitement. We also chat about degrees of separation from jazz musicians across every scene that gives credence to the saying, it's a small world, and a studio reading session where soundcheck turned into an etude audition. Moving on to the release of the week, this is Prologue, the awaited release from the Stephen Feifke Big Band, featuring musicians such as Martina De Silva, Benny Benack III, and Chad Lefkowitz Brown, and it is comprised of previously released arrangements on YouTube through the years. It highlights the origins of the Stephen Feifke Big Band coming hot on the heels of his debut big band record, Kinetic, and it will be released exclusively on streaming platforms through a partnership with a new household name, Law Reserve, an independent label in Brooklyn that is featuring some of the most killing musicians on the New York scene right now. If you want to support this release directly, you can go to Stephen's website to purchase a digital copy at stephenfeifkemusic.com. For more information on Law Reserve, you can head over to their website, lawreserverecords.com. And for all things Stephen, all the time, you can follow him on Instagram, at Stephen Feifke. Now moving on to the Monk shows of the week, the four that we want to plug are the Michael Malone Quartet on Saturday, October the 9th. Then following on Tuesday, October the 12th, we'll have the Russell Hate Quintet. The very next day, Marcos Varela Quartet on Wednesday, October the 13th. And finally, the Echoes on Thursday, October 14th. Tickets are available for the limited in-person audience at monksjazzclub.com. And as always, every show will be live streamed with links to donate in the top right-hand corner of the screen. That is it for all of the plugs and shows this week. Let's dive into episode 57, Paul Baker. This is Off the Bandstand. Yeah, I grew up in the Dallas area, in the suburbs of Dallas, North Dallas. Um, public schools, all that kind of stuff. Started playing clarinet when I was in third grade. Mm. Um, I don't remember ever asking to play clarinet or wanting to play clarinet. I was mm. just in band all of a sudden, and they said, we're going to get you a clarinet, and here's your clarinet. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I guess I kind of took to it. And so I started playing clarinet, and then... Uh, Junior high, switched to bass clarinet, and it was just all in the concert bands and stuff. Had yeah. no clue about jazz or any of that kind of stuff until I got into high school. And uh, I guess my junior year, the uh, the jazz band was really, really good. Mm. And we had, at that point, there was a really good director and uh, with very sophisticated tastes. Mm -hmm. And a lot of, after that, Doug Hall was in that band. Okay. If, you, if you know the name Doug Hall, the pianist mm. uh, who was here in uh, Austin, um, well, I guess for a long time until he passed. Mm. Um, anyway, Doug was in that band, and uh, who else? Herbie Belofsky mm -hmm. uh, is a drummer here in the area. I was in that band. I'm trying to think of anybody else off the top of my head. I guess not. Uh, anyway, um, but really, really good band, great yeah. musicians. And I said, ooh, I want to do that. Yeah. And um, so the guy who was playing baritone sax graduated that year, which left the chair open. Uh -huh. And so I said, okay, um, I want to be in a jazz band. How do I do that? Well, you got to play Barry Sax. <laughs> okay, give me one. <laughs> sure. I, I had never touched one. And they said, okay, there's three of them over there. Go pick one up and take it home. Yeah. And uh, here's the music, the that's, audition music. That's very nice. There, There's one right. <laughs> we just have one sitting around. Take yeah. it home. Yeah, well, in the summertime. Yeah, In the summertime, sure. so it's not being used for anything. So I just grabbed a, a Barry. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, went to the store, got some reeds for it. And... Um, Learned to kind of kind of make a noise on it, and I yeah. came back to, aud to audition for the chair, and uh, the director said, "Okay, here we go. Um, you know, so we'll start. The, here's the, the chart, and I'll count it off, and you play." Yeah. And they go, "Okay, one, two, a one, two, three. And I sat there. I said, "What are you sitting there for?" I said, "Well, I got eight bars of rest." 
<laughs> okay. Uh, so I said, okay, so let's take it bar nine, shall we? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> and so it's I. It's like a wise guy over yeah, there. So, yeah, 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 that's, yeah, you sure. said that's, that's where we're going to park. Yeah, right. Uh, that's what it says. Eight bars rest. Um, and he said, okay, so bar nine. So one, two, a one, two, three, four, bump, bump. Okay, you're right. You got it. You're in. Yeah. <laughs> so that was my that was my audition. That was my entrance into the world of jazz. Yeah, um, was, and it was mighty, one note. A mighty, uh, yeah. Oh yes. Was it a samba? So uh, it's a bad it, it was joke. not. I have, I have no idea. Yeah. Uh, just a one note samba. It's <laughs> exactly. a bad joke. It's a cheap joke. We'll cut that one out as well. Please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's a new writer. Quick. Sure. Um, so from then I was in, in jazz band. Um, my father was a hobbyist pianist. Mm. Uh, he had studied all, when, as he was growing up, classical piano and stuff. And he was a huge uh, Dave Brubeck fan. Mm. Uh, he grew up in the time, uh, in the 40s, and particularly in the 50s, when Brubeck was really, really the biggest musical thing, sure. jazz thing on the planet. And, um, and he had, actually, at that point, my parents were living in Boston, New England, mm. where you know, all the Brubecks were from and stuff. So, um, anyway, Dad had all his books, all the books, transcription books were out. Mm -hmm. And so, not knowing any better, I would just kind of sit there and kind of tinkle through and try to find... At that point, you know, Brubeck has hands that are like this. So sure. humongous. So, you know, tenths and elevenths and these huge five-note chords and yeah. things. And I would kind of try and piece them together and kind of figure out, well, that, that sounds cool. Yeah. That doesn't sound... That, that's weird, and that sounds... And then... Um, I remember one day in high school and walked into the den and dad was playing and this is going to be geeky as can be. I'm here for it. Okay. So my father is playing along and he lands on a D flat 13 sharp nine. I'm uh, sorry, sharp 11. Mm. I mean, full, just boom, the full chord, bam. Yeah. And we had a big old upright grand piano. It's this beautiful thing. Um, and it just rang and resonated, and for some reason, that hit me like right between the eyes. Yeah. And, got, and I l literally stopped cold in my tracks and said, what was that? Yeah, yeah. What makes yep. that sound? Yep. And I had to know, he said, okay, well, it's this, 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 and this, and this makes it a seven, that makes it a nine, that makes it this, and oh, okay. And so that's, I can kind of trace my interest in how to make sounds yeah. from that point. And the other thing that happened in high school, on the first day of rehearsal of the jazz band, that I was now in somehow, <laughs> um, the uh, director was asking, uh, unfortunately, a, a new director, different director than the one that had been there the year previous, but he was asking, okay, uh, you know, who wants to learn how to play solos? Who wants to do this? Who wants to do that? Mm -hmm. And he said, okay, uh, and who's going to write charts for the band? And... I swear to God, I have no memory of any muscle motion over here at all. <laughs> but I somehow I looked over and my hand had gone up to here. Yeah. And it, I caught it out of my vision. Went oh, and you know, I put my hand yeah, down. Sure, sure, sure. And he go, oh, Paul's going to write some charts for the band. <laughs> what? Well, okay. Had never, I'd yeah. Never thought about it. Never wanted to do it. It was never an aspiration. Yeah. It was just, I'm stuck doing it now. So I guess I got to go do it. And um, I went home, and uh, I've, I've been kind of working on uh, on piano because I'm, you know, I'm a composer, yeah. piano player. Just sure, kind of, sure. Eh, you know, not not I can't read notes too well, but I, yeah. I can find what I need to find. Yeah, sure. Uh, and I was working on um, what are you doing the rest of your life? Mm. The ballad there of Michelle Legrand. Um, and so I did. A, we had a, an all-state trombone player, uh, and so I did an arrangement feature ballad for him. Mm. On what are you doing the rest of your life? And this was and in high school. This was in high school. I mean, um, that's at this point I'm 16. Yeah, that's incredible that you <clears throat> were able to. I mean, orchestrate stuff. You know, like it, I was just learning my natural harmonic and melodic minor scales, right. and really just trying to memorize fingering so I could pass it off and then go hang out behind the band hall. <laughs> and you're like, you know, writing full charts. I for, was very, very fortunate uh, to be. In those programs, those band programs at that point in history, yeah, it was just kind of one of those golden eras where the right directors and talented students, and it all came together. Yeah, the uh, the six years that I was at that point, uh, junior high started in seventh grade. So uh -huh. the, the six years I was in public school bands there were 
really good. Yeah. Were they giving you kind of like mentoring sessions of how to format charts? Were you handwriting all of them? Everything was on by. Matter of yeah. fact, the, the first chart I wrote not knowing any better, I wrote the parts out. And okay. I took all the parts in, and the director said, well, where's the score? I said, what's that? <laughs> I said, what's all the parts? So I had to go home and write it all. all I had to go yeah. home and make a conductor's score. Yeah, sure. Because it just never occurred to me that that's what they had, that, that they yeah. actually did yeah. that. Just, yeah, right. I have to write this thing out twice? What? <laughs> i got to write it here and, and there? Okay. You, you should have just been like, well, you got a whiteboard right there, and I see some scotch tape. Why don't you just <laughs> tape them all up? You just read them left to right. Well, I mean... This, he said, because um, I was uh, struggling with drum parts mm -hmm. as, as a horn, as a saxophone player, well, as a clarinet player. Of course. What do I know from drum parts? Much yeah. less drum set parts, right. you know, and, uh, which are a completely different universe. And he said, well, just you know, go home and write the part out. Mm -hmm. So at one point, I literally wrote out, okay, letter A in English, you know, yeah. play eight bars to letter B and then play and, and do this. And, and I wrote like a paragraph. Yeah. And here's a drum part. Yeah. Like, no, no, son, that is not what we're talking about. <laughs> sure. Was this an arts high school? No, this is just a regular public school. But so the music program yeah. was incredibly strong. Mm -hmm. We um, very, very fortunate. The head band director, uh, a guy named Dr. At that point, just Howard Dunn, uh, went, went later on, went on and got his doctorate. Mm and uh, taught at SMU. He was the founder of the Dallas Wind Symphony. When, Whoa, when, okay. when he left uh, Richardson High School, uh, he took a job at uh, SMU yeah. there in Dallas, and uh, shortly thereafter formed what became the Dallas Wind Symphony now. Wow, that's insane. Lydia, who I mentioned uh, before, yeah. uh, uh, graduated from Berkner, and her parents, oh, okay. her, yeah. her folks live in Richardson. Yeah, so, Berkner was so brand new. Yeah, uh, yeah. That's I think they opened up my senior year, junior year, something like that. So yeah, okay. that, it was it was brand spanking new on the east side of town. Wow. Yeah. So anyway, um, how we're done leading the program, we would do stuff. We did uh, Hindemith, the symphonic metamorphosis, all four movements. We did yeah. Strauss tone. We did Don Juan. We did Till Eulenspiegel, as a wind ensemble, not yeah. an orchestra, as a wind ensemble. Yeah. Um, all, all kinds of stuff like that. So very very sophisticated music for a high school band yeah and uh so it's just and we had players oh my god we had players um i think our senior year we probably had just about every principal in the all-state jazz all-state wind ensemble wow yeah it was just i mean crazy man. crazy good players uh great private teachers uh you know a fantastic head director yeah um very high standards that yeah. we were held to and everybody worked it was it's unusual that at that point everybody the 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 culture was that everybody contributed there was mm -hmm. no star no ego it was this yeah we got to make the band better yeah right which is really really unusual yeah to yeah have I that mean, many talented kids sit around and it's all part of yeah which I attribute to Howard Dunn just to, to create that culture and that mindset. Yeah, that's that's very rare, and that's the thing that like everybody strives for, and it's it's the hardest thing to get. I mean, I feel like you can cultivate. I mean, some people have like natural abilities where they're just you know touched by God in some kind of way, and then some people have like really great work ethics and stuff like that. But to to try to get somebody to care is the hardest thing because right. the more you try to get them to care, the less they might. You know, uh, there, just in, I, I think the the driver behind that was probably the Everybody realized and recognized it, it sounded really good. Yeah, right. It was. It's really fun to perform at a really high level yeah. with everybody else performing at a really high level. Like this is really cool. Yeah. This is really special. This is. This is not, you know, Zuban class or something. <laughs> this, this is. Wow, we're doing this. Yeah, I remember in uh, high school. Uh, I was a, a trumpet pra player primarily, and uh, Brazos Wood was uh, named the oh, 2013. Yeah. That's a yeah. great program. Yeah, it's uh, a great program. Brian Casey down there uh -huh. was, uh, has been my you know mentor <laughs> numero uno, and uh, you know we were played the 2013 uh, 5A TMA Estate on mm -hmm. Band thing, yeah. and uh, played in the uh, the Lila Cock room. Right. I remember going <laughs> on there. The I know that room. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember that room. Yeah, and we went in there the night before, and um, it's a barn. Uh, yeah, it's right. huge. It is. It yeah. is it's so tall and so intimidating. Yeah. But he, you know, uh, I remember him bringing in this saxophonist uh, uh, who plays the uh, or played the solo on. 
uh, Sleep My Child, the uh, Eric Whitaker piece oh, yeah, that uh, yeah. was adapted to band mm -hmm. set up for, for us specifically. And uh, he, uh, none of us had um, our instruments with us except for Zeping, and he had him play it in the room with just us and hearing it reverberate. Uh -huh. And he told us all, he's like, I want you to take a minute and stop and realize yeah. like, that this is a this is a very rare thing that people oh, yeah. get to do and to be able to create music at that level and I mean you know Daniel Montoya Jr. I'm not sure if you know that uh, know. arranger uh, and composer but he had arranged a piece that was just like uh, tune X that you know for for me at least it was like a lot of stuff in seven and eleven and mm -hmm. thirteen and you know five and stuff right. like, and and playing lead trumpet on that it was it was really intimidating uh, but just whenever it came all together and playing it in that room I mean you just go. Whoa. Yeah, you know, and it's intoxicating. Oh and, yeah, and it leads people to want to go and continue that, which obviously oh, you yeah. did. And I'm because I know that you went to UNT first. Uh, yeah, it, uh, actually second. Second. Okay, well, so um, I qualify that. I went to to Texas Tech my freshman year uh -huh. because in my family you went to Tech. Okay, that's sure. my parents went to Tech. They just said you just, you went went to Lubbock. Sure. And I got out there and realized uh, several things. First of all, that they were really focused on creating band directors. And they're mm. really, really good at that. Yeah. And I really, really didn't want to be a band director. Mm. So I knew I was in the yeah. wrong place. And uh, I was very fortunate to have a couple of friends out there who also realized that, you know, we all got to get to North Tech. We, we got to get to sure. Denton now. <laughs> um, th these are not our people. Yeah. Um, and so we all transferred over together. What year was that? Uh, let's see, school year would have been 77, 78. So I started in Denton in fall of 78. Okay, so they had already secured a Grammy uh, by that point, a Grammy yeah, nomination, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, okay, so that's, you know, and I'm, and I'm sure it had... had well, two very, actually by then. Very, oh, yeah, right. Yeah, 75 and 76. Yeah, so obviously, yeah, it's like, <laughs> we all got to get it to Denton. And it's not too much of it. It's kind of a stone's throw from, from Richardson, oh, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's half hour down the road. Yeah, so you I go mean, over there. Yeah, well, when I was in back to, back to yeah. high school, again, part of that program, um, one day, Howard came out of his office into the band hall and said, everybody, shh, check this out. Mm. And he puts on the, the, the record, and the first thing we hear is the opening track to um, Lab 75, which is uh, mm. Lyle Mays FM. Mm. And we all just... yeah. Oh my God! <laughs> what? Yeah. Oh, well, but yeah, and we were just—we didn't even know how to make sense of it. Yeah, it was all the sound and range and energy and harmony and all the stuff going on, and yeah. we were just, you know, gobsmacked. Yeah, and so that was another. It's like, oh, that's there. I'm here. Uh, uh we got to get. Yeah, <laughs> I yeah, want yeah. that. Well, that for me, not necessarily a university. Well, actually, I mean, kind of, kind of that because, because I, I mean, I. I wore it out so much that the CD is is broken now. Yeah. Like like it's it's all all warped. But I listened constant constantly to Lab Twenty Twelve uh -huh. uh, with Sean Casey right. uh, on bass bone, obviously because right. you know uh, uh, Brian was the director of the program. But I remember the tune that got that for me, where I was like, I have to go into jazz. Barn, this is yeah. this is absolutely the the move. Is listening to the Bob Kernow's L.A. Big Band mm -hmm. uh, music of Pat Metheny and Lyle Mays, yeah, yeah. and the arrangement of the First Circle, right, right, which the PM Jazz Band actually played and didn't sound bad. Like that's a hard chart. Yeah. Well, Clay, uh, 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 Brian's other son, uh, was a really really amazing uh, uh, lead trumpet player. Oh, okay. He he since had to uh, quit for some medical uh, reasons, yeah. but. Uh, was just unbelievable was our screamer in the marching band and everything right and the band was like you said about you know your program it's a strong program and the oh, readers yeah. were really good and you know I remember sitting listening to their sectionals outside uh, or, or uh, after school and listening to them do the dang it start over again but, but I didn't realize like what was going on so I kept trying to like clap along yeah. silently and, and it's like, not adding up what's <laughs> going on <laughs> yeah, right yeah. right but, yeah I mean that's just like super inspiring stuff so then you land over at UNT yeah and then I assume you dive right into the lab bands as yeah. a, a player composer both yeah both yeah. yeah okay did you what was the band that you started out writing for uh well I, when I first got there I ended up in because they had at that point nine full lab bands uh -huh. and I ended up in the eighth one I believe it was okay in the eighth so you just start writing stuff to yeah you could bring it in try this out I I had been very fortunate uh, the intervening summer 
uh, to go to what we ended up being up ended up being the very last of the uh, Kenton clinics, mm-hmm. summer clinics. The Stan Kenton band mm-hmm. uh, used to do a residency clinic uh, several over a summer every every year. Yeah, they would land, and they did one at UT Arlington, mm-hmm. and so I ended up going to that. And end up in uh, Hank Levy's band, okay, which was the top band there. Again, not knowing how I did it. Yeah, sure. C- c- at this point, I've been playing baritone sax now for two years. Yeah, very, yeah. And all of a sudden, I'm in like the top band at this. <laughs> cl- okay. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I, another reason I'm, I, I don't sound egotistical, but no. I mean, one of the reasons I left, another reason I, that I left tech, was I come in at 17 years old, and I'm first chair in the wind ensemble. I get a spot uh, on bass clarinet. Mm-hmm. I get a spot in the marching band on tenor sax. I'm playing Barry sax in the top jazz band, playing piano in the third jazz band, mm-hmm. and taking alto and clarinet lessons. Yeah. So, so you had like, a lot of free time. Well, <laughs> no. <laughs> sure. Actually, I did because <laughs> yeah, right. it wasn't that hard. Sure. Um, excuse me, guys. Sorry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but my point was, well, the realization I came to was, Okay, I'm 17 years old and I'm first chair everything. Yeah. What am I going to do for where, next? Where do you go? Yeah. yeah what, where do you go from what, there? What right? are the challenges? Yeah. Stay sober. Yeah. You know, right. I mean, you know, you go, only, you know, only go to yeah. so many parties. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. I assume uh, uh, Lubbock is only smo- uh, so, so large of a town, too. <laughs> exactly. Know? And at that point, being only 17, I couldn't even go to the clubs mm. until April of the spring semester. Yeah. Right. So I was just stuck sitting around going, okay, well, what do I do? He's watching a whole lot of deal or no deal. Like, <laughs> exactly. Price is right. Exactly. Price is right. Right, yes. right. <laughs> a lot, lots of that stuff. Yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of Star so, Trek. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so you, you're, you're playing Barry Sachs for two years. You're writing charts for two years. You're going to this program that, you know, already had secured two Grammy nominations. Yeah. And, and since every decade has accrued at least yeah. one nomination under every director that they've had. Right. I mean, obviously that's like looking forward to the future a little bit, but like I would assume that that incurs quite a bit of, maybe not nervousness, but maybe what you know, young folk would uh, uh, refer to as uh, imposter syndrome or maybe <laughs> intimidation. Did you feel any of that going I in? I was too young and stupid to feel any of the intimidation. Well, was, sure. well there was... I wouldn't say it's quite that cut and dried because uh, you walk into the rehearsal hall and the one o'clock is in there yeah. and you say, oh my God. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 you know, and after a while you learn that they're actual real people and they, sure. you know, put the horn in the case, same way you put your horn in the case. Yeah, and right. They just do a whole lot more with it when it comes out of sure. the case. <laughs> <laughs> right. And the writers, you know, are fantastic writers at that point. Um, and at that point in, in the school history, there was not any real formal writing program. Mm. Uh, these days, I guess the last 25, 30 years, they've had an actual degree in arranging. Yeah. You can get jazz studies uh, arranging track. Yeah. And so you focus on that. You do an, an arranging, or arranging recitals. You, mm-hmm. you present your works, all that kind of stuff. None of that existed when I was there. Yeah. Uh, there was arranging classes there was four semesters of arranging classes. I took the first one because you're supposed to. Because <laughs> um, you're supposed to. I took the second one. Well, you, you, you sign up for the first in the class and you do the series of classes. I signed up for the second one and a uh, different TA was teaching that one. And I do the, the first project and uh, I think I was supposed to write a big band chart for the first project. And... Um, so I wrote a full chart, mm-hmm. and he went, oh, okay, uh, you can come back the fourth semester. So I did. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And the fourth semester was, like, we did a little, like, a string chart on something, and then um, a, a chart, an arrangement for the, uh, the jazz choir, the jazz singers, and I think we had to write a jingle. Okay. And that was it. That, that was the, the writing instruction at that sure. time. And it's like, okay, I, so I can write now? I, I, don't, I don't know yeah, what. Yeah, right. Um, well, it, how fresh was jazz education at that point? I mean, was it, was it? Well, at that point, the program was already 30 years old. Okay. The program started in 47, I believe okay. it was. Um, the one part that I've left out of this um, is that, again, being completely naive and not mm-hmm. 
knowing how this all worked. Um, when I was in high school, my father would take me down to SMU mm. where the Dallas Jazz Orchestra rehearsed. Mm -hmm. At that time, it was one of the top professional rehearsal bands in Dallas. Yeah. I mean, amazing players, and great music, all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And you know, Dad loved all that kind of stuff. And yeah. now that his son's involved in jazz, ooh, okay, mm -hmm. I'll take the son down. Yeah, right. All this stuff. And so we spent many a, a Sunday evening down at the SMU, mm. you know, checking out the rehearsals. So when I ended up moving back, you know, to Denton and back in Dallas and stuff, so sure. um, have my business cards all printed uh -huh. up, you know, all that stuff. And so. In uh, January of 79, so beginning of my second semester mm -hmm. in Denton, um, I went to one of the DJO gigs. They were now performing at a club called, um, at that point it was Popsicle Toes. Popsicle Toes? Popsicle Toes, after the Michael Frank song. Wow. That is a, that is a, uh, people are just going to go to that club regardless. Yeah. They want, they want to be able to say, where'd you go this weekend? Well, I went to Popsicle Toes. Right, yeah. It was a great place. <laughs> uh, the owner loved jazz and funk and stuff in that direction. Yeah. Uh, they had a huge beer garden that was open half mm. the year. Big bandstand set up out there, designed, set up for a full big band. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> and um, so I walked up to the baritone player. And I said, hi, I'm Paul Baker. And here's my card. And I'm up in North Texas. And yeah. if you need a sub sometime... You know, give me a yeah. call. And lo and behold, he called me the next week. Whoa. Turns out um, he was the art director at uh, Channel 8, WFAA in Dallas. Okay. For years and years and years. And um, so he was very often putting in the long, long hours and was yeah. unable to make the gigs. Mm. So in addition to the school lab bands, I ended up playing with Dallas Jazz Orchestra. Whoa. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as an 18-year-old kid. <laughs> uh -huh. Talk about cutting your teeth. Sitting yeah. next to the, the big dogs in yeah. town. Um, yeah, exactly. So, but how, how did you like that? Because I, I felt um, similarly coming into the scene here in Austin because I was gigging pretty regularly by, by 19, a little bit by, by 18, uh, but... Uh, I always felt, because the people who I would start to get connected with, uh, it was a big band that was already uh, formed in town, uh, mm -hmm. which was Vintage 15. And then, oh, right. you know, I came in and started singing for them and then started to take over some stuff. But then on all the small group stuff <laughs> and all the club dates that, you know, were being booked for me or that I was then cold calling, I was playing with people like Matthew Maldonado, Ross Margitza, right. Damian Garcia, mm -hmm. you know, all these people, uh, uh, Daniel Durham at the time, just like yeah. all these people who were really, really, really heavy players. And I felt like a complete fraud because I was doing a, 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 a music studies degree, like music ed right. um, uh, with a classical emphasis but I knew that I only wanted to do that for like the facility of being able to uh, uh, kind of sing with a big band. Right. And it takes a lot of projecting, which obviously everything goes back down right. to the, you know, jazz composers. All about the air. Exactly. All about the yeah. air. Yeah. And, um, you know, I found that, you know, especially when I was trying to like scat and improvise, it was a lot of, you know, it sounded like Shuby Taylor, I'm uh -huh. sure, you know. <laughs> um, but so, yeah, I was, I, I was really intimidated, but I would not have it any other way because it forced me to get my, like, act together That is the best way to quickly. learn. Yeah. That is the best way. Um, when I left Dallas and moved to L.A. Uh, to go to school at USC, uh, you know, immediately as a horn player, you get involved with all the rehearsal bands and that yeah. stuff. And then you're sitting in with the really big dog, the guys on yeah. records. Yeah. Right. Uh, all, all those names yeah. you see in the back of albums are on, sorry, on, in your case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On, on liner notes inside yeah, the, right, the right, CD right. booklet. <laughs> um, yeah, all those guys you're sitting next to. You yeah. Know, you, Monday mornings, nine o'clock, rehearsal band, and Pete Chris leaves on the other end of the section. Uh, I'll do a rehearsal band at Mike Barone's house. I'm sitting next to Ernie Watts. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah, and, and just just stuff like that. that and I'm not, not trying to name drop. I'm just saying that's you know no. those are the guys. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, they, 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 <clears throat> I don't think it's name dropping at all. I mean, uh, this, I was going to tell you this a little uh, later in the conversation, but it just goes to show how like the um, it, the music world is small. Oh uh, yeah, and only getting smaller oh, as people and say. As you get my age, it just. Whoosh, 
I well, mean, it, it's amazing. Everybody knows everybody. Yeah. Well, you want to know what's what's so crazy is is you know I was doing the deep dive. I like to do you know yeah. as much research as I can on on every person who comes on here because I don't want to be that young guy sitting oh, in the chair that okay. goes. Oh yeah. This, this is going to cost me. Okay. Oh, it, oh this is. A, you didn't know this was a gotcha podcast. This is a gotcha podcast. Now, now I get. No. Okay, I'll get to, but oh. I I found a post from February of 2016 where you had said. Two big things happening today. Uh -huh. One, uh, Baker's Dozen, best band name of all time, by the way. Best <laughs> band name of all time. Best name. Okay. I'm gonna, For me, uh, it happened to work. It's, it's, yeah, right. There, there, there have been several others throughout history, but. For sure. Not, not mine, but other people have used the name. But yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, but it just works so well for yeah. you. Um, but uh, you said, you know, we're doing a live recording tonight. You know, if everybody could please be quieter, <clears> you know, right, yeah. an elephant. And second big thing, you were like, uh, two of my works, uh, which I, I think it was uh, Strutting with Sammy, was it? Uh, Str Strutting oh, with uh, Sammy. And, Strollum, Strollum Strollum with, with Sammy. Sammy. Yeah, yeah. And, and Arm Strength, mm -hmm. like, are being featured in uh, a, a textbook, compositional CD oh, right, companion right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. to a textbook by Dr. Ronald Carter. Right. And it's going to be recorded by an all-star big band today. Well, uh, little did I know that I then, I go, there's no way. Click on it. Of course, it's Dr. Ronald Carter. Right, right, yeah. That is, the clinician, uh, yeah. Yeah. And his son, Brian Carter, who the uh, album is credited under right, because right, he uh -huh. put together the big band. Right, right, right is now a very close friend of mine who we met on off the bandstand when I was doing it from my my <laughs> house. And get this, we're bringing him in at the end of this month to do a show with my big band and to do a show with his trio that also includes Dan Shimielinski on bass, who we're also bringing down, who was the bassist who played your charts on that thing. Cool. So it's just one of those things where, I yes, tell you, it shrinks exactly. and it shrinks and it shrinks. And you know, by the time you get to be my age, I'm 61, mm. you, know, you go to school, in this case, in a large program, yeah, and which is networked all over the place, and they work with people, you work with people, yeah. and you know you work with good people, and they work with other good people, yeah. And so it's crazy. Uh, I mean, we were what was that? Um, I was playing in the pit for Phantom of the Opera when it came through. Mm -hmm. I do a lot of Broadway pit, yeah, stuff. Sure. Um, and Phantom of the Opera came through. And some the violinist asked me if I knew a particular trumpet player. Mm. I went, oh yeah, so so and so, yeah, <laughs> yeah, sure. Right. And, and her jaw just like dry. How do you know? It was a little right. bit because this, 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 yeah. and this. And oh, okay. Yeah. And all of that to say, you were saying, you know, I don't want to uh, uh, name drop, but it, it's not name dropping. It's just the fact that you know, I mean, yes, it's huge people that you're sitting next to, but it just the the more that you become familiar with the scene and, and then get, especially in your case, getting a lot of your works out there, like yeah. the more that you're going to come across and and realize that it's the United States is a small small place, oh, relatively, yeah. you know. Yeah. I remember I used to do a lot of rehearsals with uh, rehearsal bands in L.A. Uh, Kim Richmond would often be mm. in the lead alto chair. He was just a monster player, very nice guy, yeah. and very warm and welcoming to all, all those young pups. But, I mean, keeping up with him, yeah. keeping up with all these guys. I, 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 did, uh, I subbed on a rehearsal, a rehearsal for an awards show on the Berry Book. Which awards show? Oh, what was it? Was it one of the big four? No, what, one of the, uh, I don't know, it was, um, they handed out trophies. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, so. it, it wasn't Oscars or Tonys, <laughs> it, it was, um, I don't know, Cable Awards or yeah. something, MTV, whatever it was. You know, they had a, a band, I was just rehearsing, you know, subbing for my buddy, because uh, he had another gig at the, at the rehearsal conflict. So we're playing on this chart, reading it down, reading it down, and the last note of the chart uh, hits on the fourth sixteenth, mm. like a fun chart, funk chart. So, bun to zip the pop. Yeah, there's a stinger on the end. I nailed everything except I played the last note on the upbeat. Oh no! One sixteenth early, before my horn was out of my mouth. <laughs> the tenor player next to me, the bass drum bone player behind me, and the bass player on the other side of me all oh. went, "Hey, that's on the end." Oh my gosh! Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah right, got right, it. Right, I knew right. it. I knew. It. Thank you. Yeah, I'm. A, I'm aware. Thank you. <laughs> man, yeah. do you know Brian Christensen? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Oh man, he had this really funny uh, thing that he did uh, once. It was it's a pretty inconsequential gig uh, to do it on, but uh, we were playing a big band gig once, and he 
was playing, 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 but the person who was playing like second alto was a sub. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there's a, a hit on um, two, and he brings his horn up on four. Right. And slams his horn down on one. Right, and the guy play, plays. And the guy plays. Right. And then, like, it's just like, bah, bah. Oh, yeah, yeah, and he, that, that's. And, and he turns over and he just goes, I'll save the expletive, but goes, learn to count, you know, <laughs> right? the kid or whatever. You know, and it's just like the funny, it's it's terribly uh, uh, mean to do to somebody who's probably, Oh, there's, probably, a, there's you know, all kinds of stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, there, yeah, there'll be stuff, um, you know, when it's uh, coming up to the, the, the solo section. Yeah. And as the tenor player gets ready to stand up, you, you do one of these two. Everybody, everybody just kind of gets out of the chair. So the tenor player stops. It's like, oh, is it me? Is it? He just completely throws them off, you know, or they have to, whoever it is. It's, yeah. Just, just, yeah, you do, you do the horns up. You yeah, know. sure. Or if it's, you know, you're not sure where the, where the rest count is or it's second yeah. time only, you put your horn up anyway. Yeah. And the guy goes, oh, what? Oh, yeah, there, there's all kinds of ways to screw with people. Matt Maldonado in the, the early days, because he was the first person who reached out to me, you mm -hmm. know, whenever I was, at, I was at Texas State in San Marcos and, uh, I remember uh, he would always try to get me to laugh mm -hmm. on these on these gigs because obviously as a singer you can't laugh and play at the same time and you know oh, that, that <laughs> right right exactly and that that band was playing just a lot of the the stock you know mm -hmm. chart stuff and we're playing the that's life chart the right Sinatra that's the, which is the boom pop yeah boom, pop do pop and he had the entire saxophone section do pop. just do the boom, pop. Right, right, yeah. Like super, super jittery and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I would just lose it. And just <laughs> die laughing. That's so, you yeah. to look the other way. Yeah, it's one of those things of just cutting your teeth in, uh -huh. in, in more ways than one. Some yes. of them don't even have to be musical. It's just putting mm -hmm. up with antics. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Most of playing the gig or surviving the gig has nothing to do with playing. Oh, yeah, right. No, it's all the, psych all the psychology. Yeah. All the psychology. That's a lot of what goes on. Um, in the, the, the studios mm -hmm. and you're doing TV dates, record dates, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Everybody is so good mm -hmm. and, and they wouldn't be in the room if they weren't. Well, sure. So it gets down to, okay, who's got the fancier equipment? Mm -hmm. You know, who's got the $8,000 flute instead of the $4,000 flute? <laughs> oh, sure. you're still playing that. Hand? Oh, okay. Uh. I got the new this. It's all shiny. <laughs> <laughs> it's better. Okay, great. Um, and, it's, and it's the psychological yeah, stuff. Yeah, right. Yeah, how much can you mess with a guy, and he still make that doesn't blow his take when it's, it's still the, when the, when the, when the red lights on. Yeah, 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 right. Yeah. Oh, how funny. <laughs> well, okay, so you you mentioned you know being out in L.A. and stuff like that, and I know that you went to USC and you got that certificate in mm -hmm. in film uh, uh, composition. Right now. Me, I was obsessed. With, if I wasn't listening to those big band records and First Circle and stuff like that, I was always listening to film scores. Right. Uh, and I knew that if it, I didn't go into music, I was going to go into RTF. Um, and uh, I am, couldn't be more curious, like what films, what scores, what kind of stuff inspired you to want to get that, that route going? This is the wrong answer, but... No wrong answer. <laughs> Except for the one you're about to say. That exactly, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Make sure you guys get this. Right. Um, well, at that point, um, all the John Williams stuff had come out. Star Wars had mm. come out in 77. Um, God, I sound old. Star no, Wars came out in 1977. <laughs> back in the old days. <laughs> vinyl records that went around and around. <laughs> um, hey, vinyl's making a comeback. Yeah. It is, so, it is. So, like, it is. Um, so uh, some friends of mine were big John Williams fans, you know, Superman score and Star Wars score and all those things. Um, so that, that was kind of really intriguing. I was never a really huge film music fan. Mm. Um, the way that all came about was I was, had been, I had finished at North Texas and moved back down to Dallas and was just gigging, mm -hmm. playing you know, hotel bands, that kind of stuff. And one day I opened um, the Union newspaper. Mm -hmm. Did they still have one of those? I don't even know if they still have one of those. Anyway, um, it was an American musician or something. Yeah. Uh, and in the back, there was like a half page ad for a new film scoring program at USC. And for some reason, I went, Ooh, I've got to do that. Mm. And not because I want to be a film co, I just, Ooh, Los Angeles, no, ooh, yeah. that, oh, I, I sure, got to go sure. to that. And so I applied, and they took 12 of us from around the country that applied. Wow. And 
I don't know if it's that that big a wow. Uh, do, do you think that I'm, many people? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. We'll I, think, I like 14 applied, but yeah. Right. <laughs> we're just gonna, we're gonna do the research and then we're gonna flash it at the bottom of the screen. Oh, okay, yeah. We're gonna say 5,000. Okay, you know, cool. Really pump those numbers yeah. up. Because he's so <laughs> freaking awesome. Yeah, right. <laughs> and humble too. And uh, you know, I, I my favorite line there is you know like I think humility is my greatest trait. Oh, you know, exactly. I'm the most humble person I know. That's right. You can <laughs> ask anybody. Right. Yeah. Ask anybody. Yeah. My humility is known nationwide. I mean, crying out loud. More so than the work. You oh, know? Pff, yeah. Pish. Get out of oh, town. <laughs> Continue. <laughs> So anyway, that, that's how I got to L.A. It was just, you know, I saw that ad and went, got to go do that. How long were you out there? Uh, we're out there for six years. Okay. Very good. Got out there for six years. The, the program was a one-year program and then stuck around for five years after that. Uh, spent, so that would have been 84, the school year 84, 85. Um, and then I left in January of 86, went on the road with uh, the Dream Girls. Broadway show, the national okay, tour. Cool. They were self-contained, so we spent eight months on the road doing that. And then back to L.A., just playing and... Is that super common where they'll take the musicians with them? Uh, or, or was it at the time? Uh, it was more common at the time. Mm. Uh, not so much anymore, although it's... I, it depends on the show. depends sure. on the complexity of the show. Ooh, right, right, right. Uh, like Lion King <clears throat> has a... Uh, they only hire, I think it's trombones and low brass. Okay. Seems no, like the most important. No, no, no woodwinds, yeah. no strings, no. It's, it's all keyboards, percussion. There is one uh, woodwind chair, but it's all the African flutes and penny oh, whistles cool. and all the unique, it's like 18 different things this person has to play. The Alex Coke chair. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so that person you know, travels with the show yeah. because they know that so much. For um, sure. Phantom. Carried a handful. They always carry all the keyboard players and the rhythm section usually. Yeah. And then occasionally a lead trumpet or um, a principal violin to put on the show, whatever it might be. How did you like touring with uh, with the band? Did you ever get fatigued on the music, or was it always just fun and exciting? Uh, no, it was. It's it's you know kind of panicky the, the first couple of weeks because oh, sure. it's it's new people a new group a right. new gig and you want to make sure you don't screw anything up right uh, but once you get into the flow of the gig then it's just like going to, going to the office sure you know yeah. count it off okay here we go boom <laughs> sure. uh, have you ever had that experience when you're you're driving home and you don't really realize how you got home all of a sudden you're just kind of the driveway yep okay it's so scary I, I, I did that in the pit during a show. <laughs> We were playing along in the middle of one of the up-tempo dance numbers in Dreamgirls. Mm. You know, big Motown, yeah. the horns are going, singers are dancing, all, all the stuff going yeah. on. And I don't know where I went. I just kind of mm. zoned out. And I came back, when I kind of came back to attention, I was actually in the middle of playing. <laughs> I was in the middle of the note. I was playing yeah. my horn. It wasn't like I was on a I was just playing my horn. And at the first chance, I said, I turned to my buddy next to me and said, what the hell, did, did I screw up or something? I said, no, you sound great. Yeah. <laughs> I had, I, but the thing is, I was three pages behind. Oh, so it was all committed here. It was all up here. Or yeah. I was just planning on a total autopilot. Yeah. And I had to flip pages to catch up to yeah. where we were. Yeah. You know? Oh, my gosh. That's only happened that one time. Man, it was, yeah, it freaked me out. I mentioned that to Sean uh, Giddings. His episode just released this morning, and uh, we had him on a couple of weeks ago. And uh, he did his show. Do you know Sean? Uh, we've met a couple of times. Yeah. Um, he was doing his album release show for Red Willow, his new record here. And uh, he got to the tune of Gothia, and he was like, all right, I'm going to need music for this one. And then he just flips like page, 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 page of the past like six tunes that he didn't need the, right. the music for. Uh, man, that's so interesting. Yeah. So you were with them. And then what was the impetus for uh, jumping off of the tour? Where'd you go after that? Uh, when you're doing something like that, there is a definite arc to, okay, you're getting better, you're getting better, you're maintaining. And after a certain time, then you start to sure. decline. Yeah. And in, in, in your, your playing and your attitude and your health, all this stuff. Right. And as it turns out, um, we were going to be uh, in Dallas at Fair Park Music Hall. And it happened to be my wife's birthday was mm -hmm. the last Sunday of that run. Okay. So I said, okay, that's, yeah, that, the, that's the sign. It all lines up here. The stars have yeah, aligned. Yeah, so I gave yeah. notice and you know, get off yeah. at that point. 
It, there's also something that, you know, just kind of reading some of the credits, um, seeing people like Ray Charles and Aretha Franklin and I, I believe yeah. uh, Nancy Wilson, yeah, was, was on that list. You know, some people think like, read that and they go, man, how did somebody get that gig? So I'll ask, man, how'd you get, the how'd gig? You get that gig? Yeah. Um, you're at that point in time, one of the top players in a relatively small market. Yeah. And you're in with the contractor. Yeah. And so when Ray Charles or the Symphony, who it was called, oh, that was, that was a Blues on the Green thing? Okay. Or something. Um, large citywide thing. So they contracted Mike Mordecai. Mm -hmm. Oh, right. And yeah. then Mike said, okay, who do you need? You need body, 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 body. Okay, yeah. cool. And so that's that's how I got the call. Amazing. And yeah. same with Aretha and... Uh, I guess Mike probably did Nancy Wilson. That was that was at UT at Bass, and I think Mike was contracting at that point, so that's probably, yeah. probably how it got on it. Yeah, man. Flashing forward because I, I want to talk a lot about you know your writing, um, and as a latent writing for you know all of the different difficulty levels like mm -hmm. middle school and high school, which you know kind of seems like kind of full circle too. You know, like yeah, it, in a way coming back in, in a way, yeah, I'm a whole lot better at it than right. Right yeah, now for than sure. I was back then. For sure, there's some drum parts. I hope. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, hope. yeah. Right, right. Very, very specific. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess did anything really change much for you uh, functionally as far as workflow over the <laughs> pandemic? Because it feels like I, I had looked at your your uh, YouTube channel, which has like all of the kind of right. score as it goes, flipping through, and it seemed like it was just like boom, 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 like all in 2020. So did that slow you down at all? Um, no, basically, what I came to the realization because I'm kind of a luddite in a way. Mm. Um, you know, I'm really good at the musicing part of it. I'm not mm -hmm. good at the marketing part of it. Okay, uh, which is bad for you when you have a business. Yeah, it's you can a, hire somebody to do it a, for you. Well, you got to make enough to hire somebody. Yeah, no, fair enough. <laughs> so, <laughs> I need interns. That's what I need. I need interns. <laughs> I need Just studies. don't po poach any of these guys. <laughs> right. I'm trying to hold on to them. <laughs> so, um, the realization was that, okay, I really need to start my own YouTube channel. Yeah, sure. Uh, actually, if I think back on it, I, what came, that came about as a result of some polling that I did mm. on various Facebook band director groups. Okay. Because uh, previously, every year, I would uh, create a CD mm. and hand those out at trade shows or gay, or whatever, you know, yeah. mail them off, that kind of thing. And so um, I would ask around, and people, do you want CDs? You want, yeah. what, what, you want emails? You want, and nine out of 10 people would say, YouTube channel, YouTube. Yeah. We don't want CDs. God, no, no more CDs, Yeah, please. right. And at that point, you know, the, Apple was starting to get rid of the drives, even. Mm -hmm. the, the, the MacBooks wouldn't even have a CD drive on it. It's like, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so that was the impetus to finally go put everything on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, So yeah. that's why they all have the same day, because they all went up the same day. Oh, okay, gotcha, yeah. gotcha. See, I thought you were just pumping out like, oh, no, no, know, no, no, 30 no, no, charts no, no, no. in a year or oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Dang. No, no there, there's 100, 102, 103 titles or something, I think, now. Okay. Up there. So no, no that's, <laughs> I'm good. I'm not that good. I was, I was like, <laughs> man, do you have that, like you've done the opposite of slowing down. But, but I mean, even still though, like how did you feel that the past year uh, affected your uh, writing? Uh, uh, the writing was, well, it was, I think a, a lot of people, particularly creatives, went through a, a real mental health challenge. Yes. Uh, particularly, well, see that the shutdown happened really in March. Because I was <laughs> sitting in the pit at Bass Hall. We just finished uh, the matinee of Aladdin. Yeah, right. And they said, I am, boom, as of now, you're now unemployed. The campus is closed. Bass is closed. The school is closed. Yeah. Pack up and go. Yeah. <clears throat> we're done. Sorry. And so. And you were down there with like <clears throat> Steve Hawk, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, Steve and was Ron traveling with the show. Wilkins, yeah. Yeah, Eric Johnson, Ron Wilkins, yeah. uh, Mike Sailors. Was down there, uh, Jake Lampa, mm. uh, where and I were the two reed players. Um, yeah, a great band. Yeah, great band. We were. I got the uh, the conductor was really really bummed out, not just because of getting the run canceled. Yeah. Like, he finally had a really good band. Yeah, sure. <laughs> it's like, sure. This is going to be a lot of fun for yeah. three weeks, and now pff, gone. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so starting from that point, I already had several projects kind of in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I was always fine up until about you know, July-ish or so. Yeah. 
And then I kind of hit me, and then it's just nothing and nothing and nothing. And then the real struggle, like I said, is for any creative. Mm. It's like, hey, what do I do? Why? What am I doing? Yeah. Why am I doing this? Yeah. If it's not going to be played, yeah, like that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, why? You know, am I still a, com a composer, a musician, if I'm not doing anything? Yeah. And so it, there was a, a lot of. A lot of head banging on the wall. You know, yeah. What am I doing? What am I doing? Why am I doing this? And then soul searching and you know, ups and downs, all that kind of yeah. stuff. So I was, I was still able to do some work in there. I had uh, several projects did kind of come in over time. But uh, yeah, it was a real struggle. Yeah. A real struggle. I'd say up until the last oh, six months or so, I've kind of, kind of finally That's great. reoriented it and landed. And OK, boom, this is what I do now. This is why I'm doing it. Yeah. And so. I, Oh, get the head straightened out and get back to work again. Yeah, and it was nice to, you know, like the, we just said <clears throat> off camera before before we were rolling, but just that kind of thing where you're like, I was going to write something for me, you know, body and soul, and then I went a completely different direction oh, for it. Oh, yeah. And, and do you feel like uh, writing for yourself, writing a chart for either something that you might do with, you know, if you had a, 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 a date, like a, a baker's dozen date mm -hmm. type thing, which I know has like turned into tonic, right? right. Like mm -hmm. uh, officially, but do you feel like writing for yourself uh, kind of rejuvenates you and gives you more energy and inspiration to keep oh, completely. writing? completely. As opposed to just kind of the, the middle school band charts? Yeah, because one, um, the middle school band and the, the stuff for the educational market, while you try and make it as musical as possible and you know as mm. much art as possible in the end, it's product. Yeah. However good it may be, if it's last year's, they don't care. Yeah, right. That's last year's music. Yeah. All of a sudden, it's no good. I'm sure. Which I never understood. Yeah. It goes um, in a book. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's in the back of a file cabinet someplace. What's new this year? What's the good stuff this year? Well, you don't, you don't want to hear about it in the first place. You don't you want emails. You don't want flyers. You don't want this. Sure, you know? sure. So why yeah. do you, you know, yeah, right. I have new stuff? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so that's one of the things I did learn uh, in L.A., uh, particularly uh, with TV music. Mm. It's just product. Mm -hmm. it's, just, it's just, you know, the notes are your tools. Yeah, right. And this is the scene. And, you know, you write this, and that doesn't work. You yeah. erase it. Yeah. You know, I was um, sitting at home one day, and a friend of mine called up from, uh, he was in the middle of a, a mixing session in a studio. And says, Paul, my, man, my, my chart's not working. I don't, mm. I don't know what's wrong. <clears throat> and he had just, uh, he had like three or four different things all happening in the same frequency range. Like he had, mm. had a, a beautiful alto flute melody. So sure. all kind of a middle C-ish, sure. give or take. And then he had saxophone backgrounds. Mm. And he had trombone backgrounds. So he had all these different things going on all right in the middle of yeah. the area. And I said, well, you know, just get run of one of them. You know, yeah. drop the saxes or, or drop the, the trombones or something. And he said, but I, I wrote those notes. Yeah, right, yeah. So said, yeah, and you can erase those notes. You know, yeah, just, for you know, sure. Hit mute. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Keep, keep, keep that and then put it into your own thing. Right, you know, but it yeah. was just, uh, I had to, you know, it took a while to convince him that it's, it's okay to yeah. erase something that you wrote. Yeah, for sure. You know, they're just notes. They're yeah. tools. They're, they're bricks. Which know? is a hard thing to, to uh, I'm sure, come to terms with, though, because of the fact that everything that one writes or, or we hope that one writes is profoundly personal because it comes, you go, oh, this, this is something that I created. There's this really great uh, uh, <coughs> meme online of this uh, otter uh, holding a baby otter and like the, the like words on top of the meme, yeah. the meme is like, I made this. And they're, <laughs> they're, they're, the both otters are kind of like giving somewhat of a smile. Oh, of course, yeah, you right. Know? And it, it's, it's, it's special, but, but you're right. You know, whenever you're doing that contract work and it is product, you kind of are at the mercy of, you know, leaving kind of that uh, uh, conviction of your own thing yeah. kind of at the door a little bit and just giving what well, works. The old axiom is, you know, the, the composer's greatest tool is the eraser. Oh, man. That's, <clears throat> that's, that's good. And if you ask any... Any great improviser, it's you know it's what you don't play. Yeah, you know it's it's you know, Miles is always a classic example. You know you leave the space. Yeah, if you got nothing to say, don't say it. Exactly. <clears throat> yeah. You know. You know, and something I was going to ask about writing those charts for um, uh, kind of educational purposes in middle and high school is that you know I said earlier that 
while you were writing big band charts, I was <clears throat> learning the difference between harmonic and minor scales. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of young musicians who are in band who maybe have a school uh, jazz program but are not super hip yet to a bunch of bebop stuff and you know like in my case I was like oh I know Michael Buble and Frank Sinatra you know <laughs> right. which you know I always like dog on a little bit just in terms of like it being like the very commercially successful stuff but it's like something's got to get you Frank involved uh, yeah oh yeah. well yes yes of, <laughs> of course of course um, but like I remember uh, Richard Burke said to me there oh, was a yeah. um, uh, uh, I won't say what it is, but there was a group that I just didn't really uh, care for mm -hmm. too much. I thought it needed to be a lot more heady and a lot more involved. And he was like, look, he was like, I totally understand. And I feel the same way. But uh, if you want people to get involved in French cuisine, they're not going to go to some heady, hole-in-the-wall, authentic they're, they're, French they're cuisine. They're not going to go for the snails first. They're, yes, they're going to go to... La Madeleine or La Madeleine, right. right? And they're gonna have that, which is not like the most authentic no, no, French, French thing, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, right. He's like, but then that might make them want to go and do something else, right? Right. And so I feel the same way about um, you know, kind of middle school and, and high school uh, band stuff when it comes to jazz charts, because you are having to write for a lower difficulty level, right. something that is palatable and not just the most dense bebop lines that are going to alienate someone who it just goes completely over the head and they get intimidated. So how do you balance uh, writing charts that inspire the same inspiration that we have listening to Marie? Schneider, right? But keeping that same excitement, but writing some things that's more scaled down. Like, what approach do you keep? Uh, there? There's a whole bunch of different things you have to keep in mind all at the same time. It's kind of like you know, if, if you're old enough to remember uh, the the uh, the variety acts who would have plates mm -hmm. spinning on poles. Yeah, you know, yeah. Spin yeah, up, yeah, and yeah, over here, all, all the kind of stuff. Back on the Ed Sullivan show. Yeah. Um, that's kind of what you're having to do. You're mm -hmm. trying to juggle. Okay, I've got this idea, but it's going to be too technical for uh, a third. The way I keep it in mind is I'm essentially writing for 13-year-old kids. Mm -hmm. uh, and they've been playing their horns for a year, maybe two. Yeah. So there's a lot of technical stuff that they don't have and aren't going to have for a while. Uh, a friend of mine who's um, a copyist, professional copyist and engraver, uh, even made the point that I hadn't even thought of. He's like, yeah, when we go through your, uh, he happens to be the guy who <laughs> uh, engraves all my charts for Alfred. Mm. He says, yeah, we go through and we find like the, the B sharps and the E sharps mm. because, and the A sharps because they don't know those notes yet. Mm. They know B flat, they know yeah. F and C, they don't know yeah. B sharp yet. Yeah, right. And so we go, we go change all those. Yeah. Like, well, I hadn't even thought of that. Yeah, you know? right. So th there is some, some agility that has to come into play that like, Stuff that we take for granted, mm. they don't know yet. They haven't learned yet. Yeah, right. They, we're, it's so rote for us, but they haven't got yeah. to that bottom of the hill yet, much less gone up the hill. Sure. Um, so you have to keep that in mind. Uh, the other thing, which gets then points to taking your idea, which might be fairly complex, or even mm. just nominally, you know, a simple bebop line. Yeah. But. You know, again, triplets might freak out some kids. Um, sixteenths are f for middle school or are forbidden. Inherently scary. <laughs> you will never write a sixteenth. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Can you write a big band chart for a uh, 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 middle school called inherently scary? I doubt it would sell, but yeah, I could. Yeah. yeah just, just for me, I'll commission. It. Okay. Okay. Great. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But continue, yeah. I'll, I'll, expect, I'll, I'll expect a check in the mail. Well, just have an invoice. Leave it with, <laughs> yeah, leave it with Charlie. Right, you know. okay. I'll, I'll be sure and do that. That's my one mention. <laughs> um, so, yeah, you, you got to take that idea and then really take it apart and say, okay, the line might do all this. Yeah. Okay, so what are the points of emphasis? Well, it's aiming at this, so i yeah. got to have that. I need to have the approach to it I need to have that shape, so it's got to have this and that and this and this other thing here. Yeah. And you take it and you distill it down to what might be a bunch of triplets and fast eighth notes to might be you know, a couple of quarters and a couple of eighths. Yeah. It's the real kernel of the idea. Yeah. How little can I get away with and still get that idea across? Yeah. And that's what it takes. And yeah. then harmonically, uh, again, for the young kids, you can only do so much. Yeah, right. I try and sneak things in just because it sounds mm -hmm. cool. Mm. And I like it, and it's my chart, so I can do that. <laughs> you know, um, 
even my editor at Alfred lets me get away with murder sometimes. <laughs> um, I think he just doesn't care so much sometimes. It's like, sure. well, that just sounds cool. They'll figure it out. Sure. Um, but uh, yeah, harmonically, you have to be very aware of what you're writing. Yeah. You know, half step rubs in the trombone section freak mm -hmm. kids out. Yeah. Um, as cool as it may sound. Oh yeah. Yeah. Now you get a minor ninth with the the, the two half notes, uh, the two half steps in the, in the middle of the voicing, which sounds great. Yeah. You know, very Steely Dan, all all that kind of cool yeah. stuff. But you know, for the kid who's playing the C over here and the kid trying to find a B natural against that C, yeah. somewhere. Somewhere in fourth-ish, yeah. which for a small arm is kind of yeah, out there. For sure. Um, you know, all this stuff. I, that's another thing with trombones um, is uh, what notes are available. Yeah. You right. know, you have to be, I've, I've learned so much about trombone technique in the last couple of years just because you have to be aware of what you're making the kid do. You can't just put mm. notes on a page Yeah. because it might be... You might have the kid doing this, yeah, right? You know, and again with a smaller arm, doing really doing yeah. this kind of stuff. You can't go from sixth to first, back to third, back to first, back to fifth. Yeah. Yeah, just you just can't do that kind of stuff. So you have to then modify your idea to go. Oh, okay, yeah. that's or maybe that shouldn't be a trombone thing at all. Maybe that yeah. should be in the saxes, sure. where they can easily play that, that that idea, and their fingers just have to wiggle. They don't have to yeah. throw their arm out of the socket to to make it all happen. Yeah. Well, here's what you do. You <clears> tell them you can either do this. Or you can write me a drum part. <laughs> one of the two. Okay. You're going to have to do one. You're going to have to cut your teeth somehow. That's right. <laughs> well, man, Paul, I want to ask you uh, two speed round uh, real quick questions. The first is uh, if there is a record that you would suggest everybody go check out. And if it's hard to narrow it down to one, then you can say a couple. But if there's a record uh, that you're listening to this week, this month, this year, this decade, what would it be? Oh, man. And why? Um... Wow, you should have asked me that yesterday, so I can't come up. <laughs> well, that's why that's why I love to ask because everybody <coughs> says that. Oh, I wish you would ask me before, but it's like no, I like to I, I like to get that just whatever's on the tip of their tongue, you know. Man, um, I would probably start with some Jim McNeely stuff. Okay. Um, from the the uh, VDR band, the WDR mm. band in Germany. Some of his stuff. Uh, their stuff is fantastic. Uh, the San Francisco Jazz Collective yeah. is amazing. That new lineup that they just released like yesterday or whatever or two days ago for this season is going to be great. Yeah, but even going back, yeah. I mean, Andre Hayward used yeah. to play with them back yeah. in the day. Um, but their, their whole collective body of work is just mind-bending. It's, it's mm -hmm. fantastic. Um, Vince Mendoza stuff. Mm. Uh, the, Have you uh, heard that uh, uh, VDA big band uh, Fred Hirsch and Vince Mendoza uh, album Begin Again? It came out in the past couple of years. Uh, I think. I've heard some of the tracks. I don't remember a whole. I remember I kind of went by it a little bit. Yeah. Um, I'm not a big Fred Hirsch fan, so okay. I'm a Vince fan definitely. But sure, uh, sure. Fred is kind of a hit and miss with me. So okay. Some things gotcha. that go, man, that's, that's gorgeous. That's fantastic. Sure. And, and then why did you choose that? Yeah, sure. So I, I don't understand. That, that's, that's an attitude that I've, I've learned to take is that it's not that I don't like this. Oh, sure. It's like I don't understand it. Sure. Like why would you, why did, why, why did this, or why did that, how did they get from there to here? Or yeah. That, so it, instead of just blocking it off and go, oh, that's crap. Yeah. You know, no, it's not. Yeah. Well, I, I found that I feel the exact same way about um, records when I just like, I go, I don't get it. I need to listen to this like 10 more times. Right. Mm -hmm. And then by, you know, the fourth listen, I go, oh, okay, I'm not really like this part. You yeah, know, yeah. there's like, and it, it, I think it's for me, I can't speak for anybody else other than myself, but for me, it's because it's challenging me. It's mm -hmm. things that I haven't heard and I've never considered. And because it's foreign to me, I might have like this inherent resistance, but then I come around and I go, this is it. One of know. the things that uh, I, one of the, the biggest benefits of my time in Denton, um, because there's such a large school of, of jazz musicians there, there's a huge off campus scene. Mm. Everybody's always hanging out at somebody's house, yeah. there's always music playing, there's always something going on like that. And I lived in a house uh, the first year off campus there with three other musicians. Mm. And it was like a 24-7 listening exam. Yeah. What's that record playing? Yeah. Who, who is it? Who's the bass player? Who's yeah, the, what's right. the tune? What, you yeah. know, what's this? What's that? 
you know, or if it's a big band thing, okay, well, what's the saxophone bar? Or yeah. somebody's second out, uh, listen to like, um, like Miles Smiles or something like that. Yeah. And everybody's going, Miles is doing this, and Wayne's doing that. Yeah, but check out what Herbie's doing. Yeah. And yeah, so yeah, we yeah. got in the habit of listening very analytically, very, mm. you know, very carefully, almost surgically, is to go, yeah. hey, the piano player's doing that. Oh, that against Wayne's solo doing that, yeah. against Tony doing, you know, fives against your threes, against your. Yeah. Okay, cool. But you kind of yeah. get in the habit of really listening carefully. Which is ear food for a, for a, uh, a oh, writer. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, for any, any musician. Yeah. Right, exactly. Uh, well, the the last question, and I love this so much. It's always uh -oh. so hu humorous. Yeah, <laughs> buckle up. Yeah. yeah, look behind you. There's actually a seatbelt uh, specifically for this. Cool. Uh, no, it's um, uh, we all have gigs from hell where things go totally sideways. Uh, can you recall a particularly hellish gig where you were like, what is going on? Um, I can tell a story about my first TV session in LA. Hit it. Um, I got a call. A, a friend, good friend of mine was the uh, orchestrator mm. uh, for the composer. So the composer had written um, all the music for mm -hmm. the show. It was for, for a sitcom. So we were going to be basically doing all the bumpers and the intros and yeah. the main themes, all kind of stuff, all in one session. And he had written all this music. And my friend was the guy who was actually doing all the arrangement of it sure. and all the individual parts and such. And um, so he calls me at like 7.30 in the morning mm. on a Friday morning and says, uh, can you be at Cherokee Studios at 9 o'clock? Because I'm still riding over here. I'm, I'm still cranking <laughs> stuff out. I'm not going to be able. He was yeah. supposed to play on the session as well, yeah. uh, but was, just, was still cranking crap out. Sure. Um, so I said, yeah, I'd love to. Thanks. Yeah. And so I get there and... Um, Get inside and meet the guys, and it's a full big band, yeah, and uh, with strings. So I like it's like thirty people or so in the studio in the in the room, yeah. And so we're kind of talking. I'm sitting next to the guy who played um, next. Um, uh, what's his name? I'm I'm escaping. Anyway, um, the guy who played the theme of Lou Grant. Anyway, mm. the alto player. Mm. And Fred Selden is playing lead alto. And it's a bunch of big, big busy yeah. studio guys of the, of the time. And um, so I introduced myself, kind of playing around stuff. And then start checking the sounds. Mm. Can we, mic checks, please. Yeah. So he plays, great. He plays, great. He plays, fine. He plays, great. Dave Boroff, thank you. <laughs> okay, here we go. And then, okay, okay, can you hear the berry player? Sure. Okay. Um, can you play a little bit more? Sure. But uh, we're still having some problems with your mic. Uh, you know, can you keep playing a little bit? Well, so somebody, we'll, we'll check it and then you come out and yeah. check the cables and stuff. Okay, try it now. Because you're just messing with me. Yeah. You know, at this point. Oh try to figure it out. Yeah, right. So, yeah, the new guy, the talking, young guy in front, about, of, in, yeah, in front of <laughs> everybody else. So, okay, I keep playing, keep playing. And I said, oh, we've still got a little problem. Can you, uh, can you just keep playing some more, please, for us? Oh, my God. <clears throat> at this point, you know, the composer's up here standing on the podium, staring at me. Everybody's standing at me and um, staring at me. And so I, the, the chart we're playing is like three pages long. Yeah. So I said, fine. Start at upper right left-hand corner. I played all the way through the whole damn part. Three pages. Oh, my God. Boom, boom, all by myself. It's, it's like a, you know, an audition, basically, which yeah. is what it was. It was an attitude. Yeah. yeah. There was an audition to see, okay, can, can, can the kid hang with the pressure in yeah, the studio? Sure. sure. So, you know, I played it all, and about halfway through it, and I look up at the bass player, uh, a guy named Bob Magnuson, huh. um, and he's got this Cheshire cat grin on his face. Oh, like, oh my man, God. okay, yeah, the kid can hang. The kid can hang. Oh, so funny. Yeah. And so I played it all the, all the way through, and they went, oh, oh okay, thank you. <laughs> we'll go on to the trumpets now. <laughs> so yeah, that was. It's like it was. It was. It was a, a gig from hell where you're, you're almost panicking. But but uh, for them, they're just. Oh, they're, they're just, having a great oh, time. They're eating it up. They're cutting yeah. it up. Yeah, they're, they're playing with a new kid. Oh, it's like a so cat with funny. a mouse. You know, just playing with the mouse just before. Oh they... man. Well, I love that that became a theme today. It's like talking about you know making sure people can hang and you know not on, not only musically but the the that's the gig the mental pressure of the situation. That's the same with anything. I mean, you look at any uh, you know professional athlete. Yeah. Guy can run. Yeah. You know? 
can he learn the plays? Yeah. Uh, can he be a team player? Can he, that's the same kind of thing. Can he execute when a stadium's screaming at him? Exactly. Yeah. Right. yeah. Can right. you kick that ball 66 yards? Instead of, <laughs> instead of screaming at him, they're trying to make him play the entire ink, <clears throat> you mm-hmm. know, in a, in a single fail swoop. Right. Man. Well, Paul, this has been so fun, man. It has Thank been you a lot so of fun. much Thank for, you. for being here. Yeah. yeah.